Welcome to TPM Vids Disney Beat, where we talk about all things Disney. If you're new to the channel, hit that subscribe button and click the bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video. We also have Instagram and Twitter. You can find us at TPM Videos. It doesn't look like much now, but what you're looking at could be considered to be part of the testing grounds for Walt Disney World. This is Flushing Meadows Corona Park in Queens, New York, home of the 1964-65 World's Fair. Today you'll find soccer players, rollerbladers, and joggers, but the view from this bench in 1964 was a little different. It was a great big beautiful tomorrow. There's a great big beautiful tomorrow, and tomorrow is just a dream away. The field straight ahead used to be home to General Electric's Progress Land, one of the four pavilions Disney developed at the fair. No other organization had their hand in as many pavilions as Walt Disney, and it's no wonder he was considered to be one of the stars. You could say it was Walt Disney's World Fair. What took place on these grounds had a major impact on Disney attractions, animatronic technology, and future resorts. But there's probably a lot about the fair that you don't know. So by looking at the successes, failures, and leftover remnants, let's talk about the history of Walt Disney and the 1964 New York World's Fair. Flushing Meadows Corona Park was originally developed for the 1939 New York World's Fair. When it came time to host the fair in 64, much of the original layout was used, but here's a little twist. The 1964 New York World's Fair wasn't really an official World's Fair. The Bureau of International Expositions, or the BIE, is the organization that oversees and regulates these expos. They only allow a World's Fair to take place every five years, and a nation can only host every ten. In 1960, when the city of New York went to the Bureau in Paris, their bid was rejected since the Seattle World's Fair was happening in 1962. The BIE advised its nation members to not participate. Many countries refused to be involved in the 1964 fair, but this did not stop World Fair Corporation President Robert Moses. This just meant the gaps needed to be filled by corporations. Well, the overall stated purpose is <clears throat> education for brotherhood. It has to be a, an educational institution to get tax exemption. Now that may have been the case, but the fair slowly became a celebration of corporate America which worked in favor for Walt Disney. Since the fair wasn't backed by the BIE, Robert Moses had a lot to prove. He didn't want his fair to be a financial failure like the 1939 World's Fair. Moses quickly realized that he'd need something that was guaranteed to draw visitors to Queens. This turned out to be the power of Walt Disney storytelling. By this point in 1960, Disneyland in California had been open for five years and was proven to be a success. Not to mention that Walt Disney was already a household name thanks to his television programs on ABC. So Moses approached Walt about participating in the fair, and this turned out to be the perfect partnership for many reasons. When Walt built Disneyland, he had corporations sponsor the park. By using other people's money, he was able to fund his own ideas, and that's exactly where his mind went with the World's Fair. If he was able to collaborate with American corporations, then this would give him the opportunity to experiment and test new ideas for Disneyland on someone else's dime. For the 1964 New York World's Fair, Walt Disney partnered with Ford, General Electric, the state of Illinois, and Pepsi-Cola. Then over the course of three years, his team went to work on creating four unique attractions. Now when the current World's Fair ends, all four of our shows will find a permanent home at Disneyland USA. It was a genius plan costing the company practically nothing for shiny new attractions and ride technology. But this wasn't Walt's only intention when partnering with the World's Fair. See, when Disney was approached by Moses, he saw the partnership as an opportunity to test his attractions on East Coast audiences. Disneyland was already a smash hit on the West, but Walt had ideas of developing another park on the East. He just wasn't sure if his Disneyland attractions would resonate. 
So there is a lot riding on the success of the fair for both Walt Disney and Robert Moses. Moses needed to recoup the $1 billion it cost to build, and Walt Disney needed the stamp of approval from New Yorkers, who are known to be a very critical audience. When the gates opened on April 22, 1964, Moses made sure to let the world know that Disney was the star, and people came to the fair just to experience the Disney magic. In addition to Disney's four attractions, Disney characters could be seen walking the fairgrounds, and with the other rides like the monorail and the sky ride, it already kind of felt like an East Coast Disneyland. The fair was going just as planned for Walt Disney, which was great news because he secretly began making offers in April to purchase land in Central Florida. Walt was more confident than ever in an East Coast Disneyland, and pieces of the fair would eventually find themselves at what would become Walt Disney World. According to this ad, you need at least five days to see everything at the fair, plus some supposed socks. The grounds covered 646 acres. There was 153 pavilions, and they were split up into five distinct areas. Industrial, international, federal and state, transportation, and the lake. Over in the transportation area, you could find the Ford Pavilion, which featured the Magic Skyway. The pavilion covered over 304,000 square feet, and according to an NBC News program, it was considered to be the fourth most popular attraction. This was the first attraction for the fair that WED began work on, and Walt Disney had the idea of using Ford vehicles as the ride vehicles. So, 146 Ford convertibles transported over 4,000 guests an hour through the attraction. Not only did the Magic Skyway introduce the world to the Ford Mustang, it was also the introduction to onboard audio in Disney attractions. In the 1965 season, Walt Disney himself actually provided the narration. Observing from the outside, you'd see the convertibles making their way around the rotunda. Then they'd enter into the Age of the Dinosaurs. These were the largest audio animatronics developed at the time, and are the same animatronics that can be found over at Disneyland in the Primeval World diorama on the Disneyland Railroad. When Disney told Ford he'd like to bring one of the most popular attractions back to Disneyland, the Ford Motor Company declined. This lack of sponsorship did not stop Walt Disney, and he wasn't going to let these dinosaurs go extinct. He shipped them all back to Anaheim, and just nine months after the fair ended, he opened the Primeval World diorama in July of 1966. As for the Magic Skyway's ride system, well, that didn't go unused either, and the technology became the ride system for the People Mover, which originally opened at Disneyland in 1967. Next, let's take a trip over to the industrial area. It was home to General Electric's Progress Land and featured Walt Disney's Carousel of Progress. This was another one of Walt's personal ideas, to create a show that revolved around the American family and this one literally revolved. The attraction was very ahead of its time in terms of technology, with its rotating theater and not to mention the lifelike audio animatronics. These were actually the first realistic human audio animatronics Disney began developing. It was actually said that guests would frequently stop fair hosts and ask them for the names of the performers on stage. That's how convincing these animatronics were back then. People in the 60s had never seen anything like it, and it was another popular must-see pavilion. Over 45,000 people went through the Carousel Theater each day. Walt Disney used the attraction's popularity as a selling feature to get GE to sponsor the attraction back at Disneyland. So after the fair ended, the Carousel of Progress opened as part of New Tomorrowland at Disneyland in 1967. It ran for just over six years until it was shipped back to the East Coast, where it opened in Magic Kingdom's expanded Tomorrowland in 1975. The next pavilion that boasted Walt Disney's genius antics of animation was the Illinois State Pavilion, where Wed debuted great moments with Mr. Lincoln. It was the third pavilion Walt Disney signed on to. After Robert Moses visited Red Enterprises in 1962, he saw ideas of a President's Attraction. Since what would later become Hall of Presidents at Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom was far from completion, Disney settled on developing one animatronic for the fair, and Moses teamed Disney up with the state of Illinois. 
The sponsorship from Illinois allowed Imagineers to continue developing their first full-range motion human audio animatronic. After a cancelled preview of the show due to technical difficulties with the animatronic, they were able to address the problems in time for it to be ready for opening day. Audiences were thoroughly impressed when Abraham Lincoln stood up from his chair to deliver the Gettysburg Address. The World's Fair guidebook says Lincoln was capable of more than 250,000 combinations of actions, including gestures, smiles, and frowns. The attraction was such a hit at the fair that Disney created a duplicate of the animatronic, and Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln opened at Disneyland in July of 1965. During the second season of the fair, this made Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln the first Disney attraction to run simultaneously on both the East and West Coasts. The last pavilion Disney had his name attached to was the Pepsi Pavilion in the industrial area, featuring It's a Small World benefiting UNICEF. Pepsi was the last pavilion Walt Disney partnered with, and everything from concept to design was completed in only 11 months. Walt Disney didn't meet with Pepsi until March of 1963, but told them he could deliver an attraction in time for the fair. So he put his team right to work, but Pepsi was initially unimpressed with the pitch since it didn't promote enough Pepsi. They still decided to go forward with the idea, and it became the only pavilion operated by Walt Disney Productions. It was hard to miss the 120-foot Tower of the Four Winds, and ads for the pavilion made sure to boast the Disneyland name. It was really the Disneyland Pavilion. Fairgoers loved seeing Disney characters roaming around, and they fell in love with the magical 9-minute boat ride. It cost adults 95 cents and children 60 cents to experience the whimsical attraction, with all proceeds going to UNICEF. At the end of the fair's second season in October of 1965, Disney packed up It's a Small World and it opened at Disneyland seven months later in May of 1966. The Tower of the Four Winds was the only thing that wasn't packed up. Roly Crump, the Imagineer responsible for designing the tower, actually hated the way it turned out after completion. He thought it was too thick and bulky. Even though it cost $250,000, they collectively chose to not bring it to California. But even without the tower, It's a Small World would still go on to become one of the most iconic Disney rides. The New York World's Fair would close its gates on October 17, 1965. Walt Disney now had all these new attractions heading back to Disneyland, in addition to new animatronic and ride technology that would be used in other projects. In a press conference on November 15, 1965, Walt Disney announced the Florida Project, which would later become Walt Disney World. The fair couldn't have gone any better for Walt Disney, and it was a complete success, which juxtaposed the controversy surrounding the expo. Sure, 51 million people passed through the gates, but this was 20 million less than the 70 million needed to turn a profit. It was a financial failure just like the 1939 fair, and it closed with $30 million in debt. Poor weather impacted attendance, and people complained about it being too expensive, not to mention that anything worth seeing required a long wait. It was also said to be an old fair in a new time, with very few new ideas. Initial talks for the fair began during the post-war economic boom of the 50s, and by the time 1964 rolled around, the world had already advanced a lot. Critics proclaimed the 1964 New York World's Fair to be the world of already when comparing it to the theme of the 39 fair. The theme was coincidentally the world of tomorrow, but at least for Walt Disney, there is definitely still a great big beautiful tomorrow. If the fair had been an official World's Fair that didn't rely on corporate America, Walt Disney most likely wouldn't have been involved in the same magnitude. Today, the legacy of Walt Disney and his involvement with the World's Fair still lives on in the theme parks. It's a small world, the dinosaurs from the Magic Skyway, as well as great moments with Mr. Lincoln can all still be found at Disneyland. The Carousel of Progress rotates every day in Magic Kingdom's Tomorrowland. And the original Abraham Lincoln animatronic from the 1964 fair is on display in Walt Disney Presents at Hollywood Studios. Over in Flushing Meadows Corona Park in Queens, the 120-foot Unisphere stands as a reminder of the fair. 
Most of the buildings have been demolished, but one of the few that survived is the Queen's Museum. The building's been around since the 1939 fair, and it used to be the New York City Pavilion. Inside on the second floor, there's an exhibit celebrating the world's fairs. It's small, but there's definitely some interesting pieces, like a model of the General Electric Pavilion, as well as the Ford Pavilion, which has definitely seen some better days. There's also tons of retro vintage memorabilia and a complete layout of the fairgrounds. Although Progress Land and the other three Disney pavilions no longer stand today, you can't help but walk through the park and feel the excitement of Walt Disney's New York World's Fair. So what's your favorite attraction to come out of the fair? I'd love to know. Leave a comment down below to start a conversation, and don't forget to hit that like button if you enjoyed the video.